Hey everybody, welcome to the new Fly Fisher. We've got a great evening uh, ahead uh, with our guest, Phil Rowling. And we've known Phil a very long time. I've known Phil almost way too long, and he's gonna say that. But he's a man that I really respect when it comes to still water fishing and quite an inventive fly tire, educator, uh, author, of course, uh, He's just a fa fabulous guy. So without any more uh, ado, let's get this thing going. Ooh, that's a nice size fish. I will catch these all day. That is what you're in for on this episode. Wow. Hey, Phil. Hey, you're Paul. in. Uh, you need to do one of those things for me. <laughs> That's quite the introduction. You like that? <laughs> that brings back a lot of good memories. Uh, that's good, Phil. And uh, first of all, thanks for being part of the, tonight's interview. Uh, appreciate you taking time out. I know you're a busy guy. You're doing a lot of stuff. And despite the pandemic, you know, the thing is, everyone uh, seems to be busy. We're crazy busy right now. You're crazy busy yep. because thanks to... Uh, Zoom and all these other types of platforms, we can now continue to educate and entertain. And of course, we're all busy making video. Yep. So why don't you tell me about what you've been doing the last six months? Because I know you've been busy. Well, yeah, I guess the operative word in this year is pivot, right? So uh, as you talked about, it's uh, adjusting to the new normal, whatever that is. Um, but uh, definitely lots of online learning. You know, in the past, spent a lot of times at shows and speaking to clubs and a lot of face-to-face. -face. And, of course, that hasn't been possible this year. And in, in a way, it's been good because that's something I've always wanted to do was to take advantage of more online opportunities um, for people that can't get to shows or, or clubs aren't in their neighborhood or whatever. And just a different way to reach out to people as well. So I've been doing a lot of those club uh, presentations, doing some online learning seminars, things like that. So... It's been busy, and then um, uh, you probably know that Brian and I have our own online Stillwater fly fishing store, and and we were worried that that would shut down because nobody'd be going fishing. Well, as you know, it's been the <laughs> mirror image opposite of that. Yeah, and we've been busier than uh, we've ever been, which is really good. I'm glad to hear that. In fact, uh, I'm willing to bet you're probably like all fly tying resource uh, websites. You had a little problem getting enough product, probably for the demand. Yeah, it's been it's been uh, challenging, you know, especially when because we sell, you know, the majority of our business is the uh, hand tied flies that are done on our behalf. And mm -hmm. just that supply chain is overseas based right from the Far East and then <clears throat> to North America. And that's uh, challenging, you know, but uh, we managed to wade our way through it. Uh, a few times I had to pull up the chair and pull out the vice and, and rattle off a few dozen <laughs> Uh, to meet the demand, but uh, thankfully things seem to be settling back down into a more normal pattern now. I'm glad to hear that. So I think one of the big things we should start off with, and we'll come back to it again, but um, one of the things that was the reason why I wanted to have you on tonight's interview was that you have been very busy because of this. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> every time I talked to you on the phone, Phil, you kept going, yeah, I'm writing that book. <laughs> yes, I've got 42 more chapters to go, Colin. Uh, it was uh, it was a lot bigger than I thought it was going to be, but uh, yeah, that all that all started thanks to our mutual friend, Mr. Rosenbauer, sitting. What? Tell the story. Yeah, we I were sitting um, at the uh, fly fishing show in New Jersey when it was still at Somerset. It's now in Edison now, of course. And uh, uh, as a speaker there, you are rotated. If you're an author, you're rotated through the author's booth. And I was uh, usually they partner you up uh, for about half an hour. And I was fortunate enough to be partnered with Tom because, <clears throat> you know, through the show, I've got to know Tom. I got to film together uh, out in Alberta. Had a great show. I still remember those hexagena coming off. That was pretty special. But uh, so anyway, we're, we're chatting away and just catching up. Um, and he sort of turns to me and says, you know, we need to do a book on stillwater fly fishing and it'd be nice if you would do it for us. So I thought, OK, you know, as you know, a lot of times it shows things are said, but uh, don't always come to pass. And and then I get an email and a call and a contract and discussions. And next thing you know, it's actually real and happening. So I'd hope to get the book done in a year. It took me two. Um 
I'm sure it's they weren't upset about that. <laughs> yeah, Thank like, goodness for the pandemic. Yes. And, uh, <laughs> well, just like getting scripts and shot lists, right, Colin? <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, that um, it took me two years. And when it's all finished, uh, over 110,000 words, wow. um, which is, yeah, which is a lot more. But it was, you know, when you say something and then allude to something else, of course, you got to cover what you're, you're talking about. You can't leave people hanging. And it's close to 300 pictures in it as well. So that's all uh, we're in the the um, and of course the pandemic did affect that um, it was ready to go in April uh, late March April of this year and of course the um, the, the pandemic uh, with lockdowns and things like that closed everything up for a while uh, to hopefully have it out for a Christmas release but that wasn't possible so now we're looking at uh, May of this year okay. so we're going back and forth copy editing and placing things like that so um, that's all moving ahead I, I've read the book a lot <laughs> <laughs> I guess a couple real important things. One is uh, the book itself, uh, because like a lot of the books that Orvis is associated with that authors publish, like a lot of Tom's books, this is like a, an overview, like the basics of fly fishing or saltwater fishing. It's not specific to one thing. It's a whole bunch of stuff. It's a whole that. bunch of things. I've got chapters on, um, you know, why you'd want to fish a lake. Um, some of the benefits of it that maybe people aren't aware of, uh, equipment as far as rods, lines, and reels, uh, accessories, all that stuff that basically fits in a kit bag. Um, very comprehensive chapter on stillwater entomology, uh, floating line tactics with strike indicators and long leaders. Remember the naked technique in Manitoba? I know you like mm -hmm. that. I did. Um, yep. Um, dry fly, uh, dry and emerger techniques, uh, fishing attractors, introduction to lock style, sinking line techniques retrieves uh i think i said attractors uh lines leaders uh, no, sorry leaders um knots and droppers mm -hmm. that's pretty well it i think the floating line chapter alone just on strike indicators and the naked technique was about 7500 words wow you know everything from leader makeup to setting the indicator properly to the different kinds of indicators for example um presentation techniques um setting depth a uh, whole pile of things, and I, I probably could have put more in there, but I, I think, I think the publisher was like, "That's it." <laughs> <You're done." laughs> uh, from my perspective, thank goodness there's pictures. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, something you can, you know, pretend to be interested while you're looking. Oh, look at the picture. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, you know me with my yeah. deep books. I like to read at bedtime, fell. Oh yeah. Sleep. <laughs> <laughs> Um, you guys I, send the crayon. <laughs> but uh, the second thing is, uh, I heard that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I think the other important thing, Phil, is with your book, people, even though it's not coming out till May, they can pre-order now. Yes, they can. They they can pre-order it um, through the Lions uh, Stackpole website. Um, I'll have to get a I'll get a link uh, that we can put up. And um, as well, it'll also, when it's out and available, it'll also be available, of course, through bookstores all over the place um, and, uh, you know, Amazon, those kind of outlets as well. And through uh, the, our, the Stillwater Fly Fishing Store they have as well, because they'll all be autographed copies that come out of our store. So Okay, autographed. Yeah, yeah that's, that's wow. a standard thing with every uh, book we, we sell, uh, both Brian and I on our store. So. Nice. Okay. Well, listen. Uh, Enough about the book. Let's talk about you and what you've been up to. Because, uh, as you said, you know you haven't been able to go out on the lecture circuit, but thankfully, you were able to get out and do a little fishing. And in fact, you did a little fishing with us. So, yep. Tell us um, about your fishing season. What you yeah. were up to? Well, it's it, you know, in a, in a good way. I, I think there was some concerns nobody would be able to get out, and then we were all kind of joking that. Gee, fishing is arguably one of the ultimate social distance sports, right? <laughs> we all usually want to be alone and away from everything. So I got to fish a lot of my local waters, which is something I didn't usually get to do, mm -hmm. um, simply because I was always away um, doing seminars or schools elsewhere. Of course, that didn't happen this year, so I got to you know explore a little bit more. I did a little bit more guiding once the uh, restrictions were listed, lifted a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, so that was good. And then, of course... Um, doing some filming um, with the show. So got to spend an incredible week at Scott Lake Lodge, uh, chasing pike and uh, lake trout on the fly there. Just uh, just an incredible lodge up there. Um, 
the luxury you did not expect. Thank you for sending me on, on that shoot. You're welcome. <laughs> You gotta love a lodge that has an exercise room. Not that I took part of that, but has a sauna. Um, you know, <laughs> it's good for dogs. yeah, um, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. I often joke to friends when I've been to lodges and they got an exercise room. That is the most neglected room in the whole facility. <laughs> <laughs> Those guys, they're hardcore. They're up early, fishing. Yeah. Come in for breakfast, fish all day, yeah. eat dinner, go fish some more, and then it's like exercise. I don't think so. No. Time for a drink and go to bed. Exactly. Crash right. and fall asleep. And then we did more of a DIY um, show out of um, Saskatchewan as well in, in the um, uh, northwest, northeast part of the, of the province, up in the Narrow Hills area, some of mm -hmm. the out fisheries up there. Um, they got some good fisheries up there that uh, I'd heard about for lots of years and thankful that I got to uh, – go out and, and uh, pursue them. They've got brown trout up there, tiger trout, brook trout, splake, rainbows, browns. I think I mentioned those. Just all of the, the major trout groups and, and the hybrids as well. Yeah. I don't think they have cutthroat. That was about the only one. But uh, neat, a unique little fishery up there, uh, quite remote and quite a, away from it all. It's really, uh, really fun. Looking forward to putting that show together. I'm looking forward to the script. Um, <laughs> Coming soon. <laughs> Coming soon in June. Yeah, not, not <laughs> late, so we shot a lot, ton of footage. You know the you know our drone footage we shoot. Obviously the show content, um, the underwater footage we got. Um, we got some pretty and we got, actually got a shot of a whitefish underwater. It's somewhat murky, but rummaging around while a couple of pike are swimming around, which is like hmm, <laughs> you wouldn't expect a whitefish would want to do that. But I guess. He was a pretty decent sized whitefish. So that was pretty unique footage you got to see, Colin. You get to see some of that and some pretty good slow motion takes too. That uh, the heart stopping um, watching your surface uh, diver or popper just get destroyed uh, by a large toothy fish is, is pretty, uh, pretty addictive. So, Phil, I want to play a video clip. But mm -hmm. before I play it, uh, Cole here, who <laughs> questions right across. The bottom of the screen here he's got a question for you you want to address that uh, thanks cole um spring uh, fishing spring ponds usually small under 10 acres how to get big browns to eat a fly when they have abundance of scuds and midges um well coronamids or midges is sort of one of my favorite ways to go after them so just go toe to toe with them um but if they're really big browns i'm wondering if there's also some other food sources that are keeping them occupied uh, when they get big, they need a lot of calories. So if there's any crayfish or baitfish present as well, uh, leeches, things like that, that stand out in the crowd. Um, even some attractor patterns like your um, boobies and fabs and watsits and blobs and all that uh, dark art stuff now that's getting very popular in North America, big, loud flies. Um, but uh, yeah, it'd be nice to get a hold of one and, and do the you know, the careful use of a throat pump and see what they're on. But when they get focused on those tiny things and there's such an abundance of them in there, it can be challenging because it's needle in a haystack stuff. So maybe I'll have to well, come out there and figure it out. <laughs> that would be the way to do it. <laughs> You'd be on the road all the time, Phil, with all the questions. I would, eh? I would yeah. Because it's all, that's, a, it's, a, those are always, you know, they're, they're challenging questions to answer because there's so many different, um, you know, challenges that uh, that's one of the fun things I like about still water fly fishing is the myriad of food sources they got to eat. And then your job is to figure it all out, which one they want, and then do your best to try and suggest that. Or sometimes you got to go completely the other way and give them something totally contrary, kind of a don't match the hatch. But you know something that's not any different than river fishing, nope. right? Nope. Like nope. you're trying to match the hatch, figure out what they're eating with the, the merger, blah, blah, blah. And then sometimes there, 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 there are thousands of mayflies coming down the river. Yep. And you need to throw a caddis. Yep. And guess what they eat? Or a beetle, right? Which is always good. I remember hearing a story one time on the Henry's Fork of, you know, everybody's matching the hatch and whether it's a left wing up or a right wing down kind of cripple, it gets right. You know, there was uh, broken legs and all these kind of things on the bugs. Maybe we need to have this. Some guy came by and cleaned up with a size 10 royal wolf. So. <laughs> <laughs> So there's the don't match the hatch uh, philosophy in action. So uh, let's just play a little video I've got here uh, that kind of it's like a teaser. Not specific, but kind of why I like pike. And I think I know you like pike from your experience in Scotland. Yes, I know.
that's why we like Pike right there. I also like the ride of the Valkyries. Nice touch. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I put that together. I was looking um, at Robert Duvall in the background. <laughs> I love the smell of napalm in the morning. I love the smell of poppers in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> You know, <laughs> oh, well, you know, I when you go pike fishing and you're throwing those big chickens and you you suddenly feel bad for little ducks, don't you? Anything little, muskrats, ducks, small pike. You know, at Scott Lake, we had a couple of uh, fish. Um, you know, with you just taking them on a popper or a big streamer, and they still got lunch sticking out of their mouth like a white fish or an, another um, sibling. <laughs> you know, everything and everything's on the menu for those and. And, and that's what, one of the reasons I like lakes because, that, that, again, the tactics I use in that book, um, I use them to catch not just trout, walleye, pike, lake whitefish, lake trout. Um, you know, if it swims and eats, I, I think I can I, – I, I believe I, can, I have a chance of catching it if I just, you know, figure out uh, what they like to eat. And, of course, pike like to eat, well, everything. <laughs> <laughs> kind of like me. <laughs> uh, you know, one thing we found at the Scotland – because we were just in there – um, right after ice off or soon after yeah. and and water temperature was really big if we went into a bay that was in the high 50s low 60s they'd be tight to the bottom and you they wouldn't you'd strip something you know tried the poppers nothing then strip something big right past their nose you just see their eyes looking at it wouldn't move go into the next bay it's 62 63 totally different fish just fired up and ready to go yeah right? Yeah, yeah, I've seen that actually in Northern Ontario. Yeah, and you're you're right. They're, they're, they look they look like logs laying yeah. on the bottom. Yeah, and uh, but they won't they won't touch fly. They won't yeah. touch the lure. Nothing. No, they're they need that temperature. Yeah, and I've seen bass even where uh, yeah pre spawn. Yeah, because it's yeah their favorite tactic was they would go outside of these bays, you know, to the entrance area, you know, the um, approaches to the bays, and that's where they'd hunt, and then they'd slide back in the bay you know, shallow water, get some warmth, help with their digestion, you know, kind of like a python or a boa constrictor in a zoo, <laughs> you know, just digesting and then go outside and get active again. Um, so uh, it was an interesting pattern, fun place to go, fun place to go. Uh, I saw a question that popped up on the screen there from Mark asking about the Nipgon River. That's a place you haven't fished. No, I'd love to. You know, that's where we met, wasn't it? Fish and Brook Trout, Fortress Lake. A long, long time ago. You're yeah. right. Yeah. That's when we actually did our first show. I think that's in our YouTube channel. Yeah. And we should explain to people Fortress Lake is a unique lake because uh, it's very remote. It's mm -hmm. just outside of Golden, B.C. And the story, as I understand it, is that uh, rangers from Jasper Park went in there. This is before World War II. Yeah, the realized there was no fish in the lake and took it upon themselves to get some coaster brook trout of all species, not just regular brook trout, coaster brook trout, brought them in by a mule on, in big barrels, dumped yeah. them in the lake, and then World War II promptly happened. They all went off to war. Nobody came back to the same job, and nobody knew about these brook trout in this lake until the 70s when somebody landed there in a float plane. Yeah. Just, I don't know, they were doing something, and he was cast a spoon. Yeah, they really took it's perfect when you think about it perfect conditions for brookie they've got obviously spawning habitat lots yeah. of the, the chisel river and lots of other uh chisel creek rather that comes in and that's where the lodge is based right on the delta there um so in the fall months when they stack up it's staggering to see how many brook trout are their water is black with them there's so many but wow. um it's as you and i saw it's perfect conditions um cool cold well oxygenated just the kind of place a char likes to live. That's the first time I showed you how to fish leeches under indicators. I remember you wondering what I was doing. <laughs> it was all new to me. I'd never seen anything like it. And it, that worked really well. Of course, we, we uh, I think they only tolerated us playing within that bay for three days. And they said, that's it. We've had enough. Go find somebody else to play with. It was pretty good. It was, uh, I was actually quite nervous going into that shoot because it was the first time we'd met and fished together. And, it's a body of water I'd never known before. It's a mountain lake, so I'm expecting this steep, unproductive, deep, tough to fly fish, you know, uh, body of water, and was pleasantly surprised to find quite the opposite. Um, you know, I've been back there a couple times since, and I recall in June one time the Coronament Hatch at the um, Wood River end of the lake there, where it gets shallow, was mm -hmm. unbelievable. I throw pumped a brook trout that filled the tube from one end to the other. I've never had a throat pump sample like that before with 
that many coronamids in a fish, even in the Kamloops area lakes and other lakes in Western North America that are famous for that kind of activity. Just unbelievable fishery. So, uh, Phil, I got a nice question here from Shane asking about your top three chronomids. That's so tough because it's such a match the hatch. Um, but I've got some favorites. Uh, my Chromie, of course, uh, either tied with a silver body and a red rib or a gunmetal gray. We used to get a color of Flashaboo. Uh, the code was 6916. They've changed the dye lot on it a little bit now. So a lot of people use anti-static bag material in replace of that. But definitely that. A fly of mine called the Collaborator. Um, it's kind of a burnt orange color, but that fly has produced for me all over North America uh, where I've gone fishing. And then a good old black and red. Um, I've got one called a PBR, but just basically a black body uh, red rib fly with uh, typically a lot of times a white bead on it. And that's probably the three I'd start with. But as Colin, you've seen, I have a few crown in the past. <laughs> that's... <laughs> <laughs> I've seen guys with a lot of woolly buggers. They got nothing on you. No, nope. I'm, ther I'm, I'm in therapy. They're, they're you know, we're getting. <laughs> <laughs> There's steps to this. <laughs> That's why it's so hard with pike fishing. I'm so used to taking so many flies with me, you know, in a, in a trout scenario where you're matching all these different bugs to, you know, just make sure you've got, you know, light, dark, and surface stuff and lots of wire tippet, <laughs> you're usually pretty good. They're, they're not all typically too selective. No, I find that a little later in the summer that can be a yeah. little fussier about what it is and the size, but yeah. you're right, generally yeah. speaking. Yeah. So um, let's talk about your trips to Argentina. Okay. Are you going to be uh, hopefully running in one of those again? Yeah, I was supposed to do one this year um, in December. I've been down three times, uh, twice in April, which is their fall. And uh, last year I went down right at this time, took uh, six other anglers with me, sort of um, escorted them down um, to uh, Estancia Laguna Verde, uh, which is down in the Patagonia region of uh, Argentina. So basically we flew where I am in Edmonton, Alberta. We flew from, I flew from there to Houston, the rest of the gang, we all met up there. We fly overnight to Buenos Aires. It's about a nine-hour uh, trip. And then we landed there usually about noon by the time you you know get off the plane and get through customs, which is no big deal. It just takes time. And, um, you know, get, get a cab. And then we, we had a hotel, you know, took care and got some hotel accommodation for everyone and just kind of acclimatized and rested and, and then, uh, you know, took in some of the sites of Buenos Aires. Pretty neat little... Uh, Little city, fourteen million somewhere. Okay, people. Phil, move on to the fish. Yeah. Anyway, so move on to the fish. The Jurassic yeah. Lake, is it not? Yes, Lago Strobel. So uh, yeah, so like next we're day, talking little rainbows, right? Yeah, little you know, just shakers. Uh, no, um, mm -hmm. probably conservative, uh, twelve to fifteen pound average in that lake. Um, uh, similar. Sorry. Do I have a picture here of one of them? Is this one of them here? Yeah, that's one of the sort of smaller ones. Yeah. Okay. That's uh. <laughs> Your, be, your proportions on fish are totally skewed after a week down there. It's it's very hard to uh, sort of come back to your local waters and get this all in. Um, you know, a 10-pound fish, most people, that's a, a trophy everybody aspires to. Uh, still water, uh, you know, fly fish, chasing trout in lakes. And usually by day two, um, nobody really, they're just natural order of things and we're looking for something big. Um, and all they're feeding on in there is scuds, zooplankton, and snails. Are the scuds are the primary food source. So no bait wow. fish, no coronamids, um, very rocky terrain, windswept. Um, that's the one thing about fishing down there. You've been down that neck of the woods as well. It can, it can get a little windy. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Patagonia is very windy. Yes. Um, we fished one day. I swear it was 70 miles an hour, and we fished. And um, the good thing, the guides are excellent. The way it's set up is one guide for every two people. Um, you're in these uh, Hilux trucks, these uh, high-end Toyota um, trucks that uh, I remember a friend of our, a mutual friend of ours who went down said when he spent time in Afghanistan as a reporter, hey, the Taliban used to put 50 cows in the back of those things. So I was like, oh, great. But uh, no, they uh, take you everywhere. And, um, you know, it's all floating line. Um, you could bring other lines, but floating line, um, they'll take dries, even though there's no appreciable hatches. They'll come up and eat a, 
you know, I fished a mouse with a scud dropper. That was uh, probably the most. <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah. I, yeah, I got to admit, I've never done that. <laughs> it works. And, um, you know, big chubby Chernobyls. Uh, and then, again, small mouse, uh, small scud patterns, pheasant tails, prince nymphs, hare's ears. Uh, balanced leeches worked really well. I, you know, that's where I took my personal best fish ever out of that lake on a on a number 10 balanced leeches. So it's not big six inch articulated uh, streamers or anything like that. The trout tend to respond to the small stuff. Um, and it's, uh, it's pretty spectacular. The food is unbelievable. Uh, lots of great wine. Um, as, as you know, that region's famous for its uh, wine down there. Um, it's, uh, it's, a, it's an incredible, exp it's, it's a great cultural experience and just cool to be. And of course, catching trout of that size every day um, is unbelievable. A lot of the people that are in my group already want to go back in 2021. So, no, that's great, and I hope you can run more groups down there. Yeah. And uh, unfortunately, Argentina was hit pretty hard, as I understand it. So, yeah, even um, Chile in the north got uh, had a lot of problems up in Santiago. I'm not even sure if the lodge is open uh, yet as well. So I'm in communication with them, trying to um, get uh, another, you know, another group of six to seven, eight anglers down there with me. So. Our friend uh, Jim Weatherwax asked, Phil, uh, have you had a chance to fish the Laramie Lake uh, system? Uh, no, I haven't. No, I haven't. I've only, that's Wyoming, correct? Right? I think uh, so. I think so. I fished uh, Wyoming. I fished uh, Monster Lake near Cody. So, uh, um, but I haven't had a chance to fish down there. I'd like to, I'd like to spend more time in in Wyoming fishing the lakes down there. Hint, hint, Colin. Um, <laughs> look, at, look at Jim's... Uh, <laughs> Fish, beer, need we say more? <laughs> Perfect. Perfect. Perfect, Jim. Two Canadians. What do we need more than that? <laughs> Tim Hortons, maybe, in the morning? Maybe, with some Timbits. That's right. <laughs> it's all about that. So maybe that's something in the future, because we are trying to shoot a lot more of our shows in the American West, not just in Canada and other places. But And, uh, you know, Phil, you definitely we want to put you down there to do some of those shows. So um, let's just talk a little bit about your fly tie I and mean, you're a heck of a fly tire phil and yeah. this is one of my favorite patterns you came up with for thanksgiving i know whose fly that i know who tied that <laughs> I'm sure i knew whose channel it was on yeah <laughs> <laughs> i'm sure the the big uh rainbow trout down there in jurassic lake would they probably, would eat that they, they would, would eat, eat that, that. And How would a big brook trout? trout? Big brook trout would eat that chicken. And pike would eat or that. Or turkey, I should say. Pike would eat that. Oh, yeah. Wouldn't it look like that after a pike ate it. No, but it'd have to be a full-size turkey for a pike, right? Yeah, there's a nice fish. There's a nice yep. sneaky pike you got there at yeah, Scott Lake. Good. Scott Lake, yep. Uh, yeah. Yeah. That was, it's all about uh, delicate presentations, right, Phil? Yeah, just <laughs> trying to hold that big, heavy head up. Oh, <laughs> the first day we went in there, we yeah. tried said like you, you mentioned something that twi twigged the memory was about the logs and we're you know i'm on the bow flying hand ready to cast and i'm looking down look at all those logs and as you get closer those aren't logs right it's like yeah, i know oh, that's a lot of pike and you just threw that poor little you know um, a black bunny leech simple as it is they like that and just flop that in and just see <laughs> all these heads turn and you're watching one follow oh, he's gonna eat he's gonna eat it and you always see that other you don't even see it comes out of left field and just hits the freight trains it sideways t-bones it and gone right never even saw the he wasn't even in 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 range when you first you're sure that one that was you know almost touching it with his nose was going to take it well, good, fun. good for little, the quick little story that i just have to say though about that uh experience I was uh, in Northern Ontario on a lake and same thing. We came up into this bay, uh, thought they were logs, realized they're big, massive pike, 40 inch plus pike laying everywhere. Yeah. And somehow, cause there was a river running into this bay. I'm casting uh, a fly and I hook a walleye. That's no more than eight, 10 inches long. And I'm like, yeah. dude, you're in the wrong place. <laughs> so, well, that's where the bad thing happened because <laughs> I unhooked him and I should have had the camera and I just went, see you later, buddy. And I, he slipped out of my hand and I guess one of those big giants came under the boat because he he kind of went underwater about a foot or two and he went, ah, I'm free. 
<laughs> he disappeared in this yeah. thing's mouth. It wasn't even yeah. like T bone or nothing, just disappeared. And he yeah. just casually swam off with him. I went, oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> oh, well. <laughs> That's pike fishing. So, um, other than your fly, oh, we're going to possibly join Do you have any details? When are you planning to yeah. go next year? Um, we're hoping for December. I'm just waiting confirmation. The lodge is trying to juggle, you know, a lot of the cancellations and everything this year and try to get it, massage it all back into some kind of schedule in uh, 2021. But uh, I've asked for about the first week of December, but if you go to my, uh, uh, fly, um, my website, which is scrolling across the bottom there, flycraftangling.com and look down the left margin, there is a travel, uh, um, tab. Just click on that. And all the details of the Argentina trip is there as far as cost and just, what's entitled with with the whole um, trip as well, gear, flies, all that stuff. And, of course, you're welcome to email me at flycraft at shaw.ca as well and happy to answer any and all questions about Argentina that way too. Perfect, perfect. Yeah. Thanks for answering that, Phil. So um, let's talk a little bit about your app, which, I mean, it's been a bit of time now. You've had this out for a while, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. And uh, – I hear it's been very successful for you and Brian and answering a lot of questions so people can catch fish like this. Yes. That's a nice rainbow. Where was that? That's uh, in British Columbia. If you can look in the background, the red roof there, that's Stony Lake Lodge. Oh, Stony Lake. Okay. Do schools out of there from time to time. Yeah. Uh, that's that, that's on my bucket list. Yeah, uh, it's, a, it's tough when you got to walk a whole 70 feet to the water. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so uh, your app, talk about your app, and then I'm going to play one of your videos. Yeah. Uh, these are videos from your app that you've given yeah, me, right? Yeah, they are. Um, the app is uh, myself and, and good friend Brian Chen. Uh, Brian's filmed with the show before as well. These still water stud muffins. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we, we're putting a calendar out this year. Um, <laughs> well, that's kind of frightening. <laughs> <laughs> to even dwell on. <laughs> well, yeah, the way is we'll raise funds by people asking us to take that off the shelves. <laughs> <laughs> no, seriously. Um, we we got together and uh, were approached by an app developer who had uh, opened a very successful hunting app. And uh, so we put this app together. It's um, a com different chapters, uh, fly tying, there's fly tying videos on there, um, leaders and knots, accessories, um, entomology strategies and tactics, different chapters, and there are video tips in there. We're close to 200 video tips on there right now. The short little two to maybe four minute long tips um, that you, it's a free download. Uh, some of the content is subscription based, uh, a small fee, like three or four bucks a month, uh, stiff, or quarterly levels or an annual level. And I, I guess the real, other than all the content that's on there, that's obviously designed to help everyone improve their still water fishing, you can take this resource with you in that once you download the videos to your phone, you don't need Wi-Fi to access them. So you can be in oh, the middle perfect. of nowhere. Maybe you see a bug swimming in the water. You're not sure what it is. You can look up the entomology, see what that is, identify it, go over to the techniques chapter, find out some different techniques to do that, and it's all in the palm of your hand. It's sort of like Brian and I joke, it's, you could have us with you in your boat, but unfortunately we just couldn't be there with you uh, to help source it out. So it's a free download on both Apple and uh, uh, Android platforms. Oh, wonderful. Yeah. So go and to then if, if people, know, what are the price points if they want to get the whole library? Because I know if I were was really interested in it, I'd want to probably pay yeah. the money and, and have the downloads because i got to tell you, I love having – videos and uh, photos of my phone and it's kind of yeah. like you know the best way I equate it is that I'll go to Home Depot with what I need to buy show it to somebody then go yeah. back to the house but then I got to watch a video on YouTube to tell me how yeah. to how to fix this in my plumbing or whatever well, that's what I usually do I look at the I if something's broken in the house you look it up on YouTube you make it adjust. Mm, I think I can do that. And then off you go to do it, right? Or no, nope, I guess I'm calling somebody in, right? Because if they do it in four minutes, it's going to take me, I don't know, 35 to 40 at least. <laughs> so what's the name of the app? Phil? The app is the Stillwater Fly Fishing App. Really uh, innovative name. <laughs> uh, it's $3.99 a month. Uh, a seasonal pass, which is a quarter, is, uh, I'm just looking up to be sure here, $9.99 a month. And then an annual is $38.99 uh, a year. So it's almost like two or three months free when you buy it in that annual pass. Okay. That's so, perfect. That's yeah. pretty reasonable, actually. For And you yeah. now, and how often do you put up content? 
Um, our goal is at least uh, when we first got it out, we really wanted to fill it up um, uh, monthly. But now every couple of months, we're putting content up. And now as we head into sort of the off season, there'll be a lot more fly tying content. And Brian and I've got some uh, other tips we've got to get in and get edited and get done. Um, but you know, the pandemic uh, unfortunately impacted our ability to get together and film a lot this year. So, um, but we, we, we worked our way around it. Um, once I get this book done and uh, some obligations I have to you, my friend, uh, then I can focus on those. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's great. Um, so why don't we play one of the videos from your uh, app? So which one would you like? The moving the strike zone? Yeah, you could do that one. Yeah, I can talk that through and what that's all about, and then uh, probably the balance leeches because everybody likes those. Okay, well let's let's do the moving the strike zone first. Okay. Yeah. Strike indicators are such a popular and effective presentation option whenever you fly fish lakes. But you don't always want to cast straight down below you and just fish in one area. I like to move the strike zone when I'm, when I'm fly fishing indicators. So what do I mean by that? Well, literally, if I was to cast straight down and let that indicator sit and work straight below me, let's say I had 10 foot of visibility around that fly. A fish has to come within 10 feet to see the fly and hopefully eat it. But it stands to reason, if I could move that 10-foot circle through a greater area, I simply cover more water and I should catch more fish. So how do I do that? Well, rather than casting straight downwind, a lot of times I'm going to cast, again I got the wind at my back, but I'm going to make a reach cast to my left. I'm a right-handed caster, I want to cast to the left on an acute angle, simply because if I somehow drop the line or mess up the cast, it's going to be blown down away from me. If I was to cast to my um, right hand side, if something went wrong with the cast, it's going to potentially blow into me and be hazardous. So I want to cast, uh, downwind, reach cast, mend, and I want to make that line land on, the, on an acute angle and just literally allow it to swing and drift down. I don't want it to form a big C and come under tension because that's going to make the fly skate, but I want to use a series of little mends. Mend a little, mend often, and just allow that to swing down on as tight a line as you can. And let's say that's moved through 30 feet, there's 300 visible feet, if you will, that that fly's moved through. And then I might let it sit and suspend below me, and then I'm going to either use short strips or a hand twist and bring that back. So if I've moved that fly and let it drift 30 feet down and then 30 feet back, instead of 10 visible feet around the fly that I talked about earlier, I've now moved it 600 vertical feet. You should catch not vertical feet, circular feet, if that's the right measure. I will have simply exposed my fly to more fish and my catch rate should increase. So think about that. Move the strike zone whenever you're fly fishing lakes using indicators. My God, Phil, you're a handsome man on video. <laughs> <laughs> As you know, that's the uh, advantage of a good editor. <laughs> <laughs> so that was great. Uh, mend a little, mend more. Yes. Instead of making one huge correction, as soon as you see that line starting to get off uh, out of you know out of where it's supposed to be, put it back. It's like walking a dog, right? You don't let the dog run 25 yards and then give it the yank to come back. It's short little taps to, to keep it in line. So. Okay, so are you reading this one from MP yep. about trolling? Yes, I have a dad that's convinced that trolling is the only way to catch fish on OK Lake. If we stop them so I can cast, it's not fishing. How do I convince him? <laughs> you know, it's, um, I don't like to troll very much at all. I hardly ever do. It. Um, you know, if I'm going to move, I'm going to pick and reel in and, and move, right? Um, other people I know will troll, but uh, um, trolling always works because you're covering water, but. Um, you know, I, I prefer to, to choose likely structure and work that and look for signs of hatches. And I'm, if, if it's the big OK Lake, I think he's talking about, you know, I'd be concentrating your dad on uh, get him out there when the coronamids are emerging or the especially in late uh, June into July when the caddis are coming off there, the big traveler sedges. It can be uh, pretty spectacular. And I think once he gets a couple of those big rainbows on there uh, on the dry fly, I think he'll uh, he'll maybe forsake trolling. 
Um, but, uh, you know, it's catching fish. It's like uh, anything, anytime you're introducing somebody new to the sport, you want to try and get them a little bit of success so they get a little bit of confidence and enjoy what they're doing. Don't take them on a, you know, a, a unique trophy hunt that they might catch one fish all day long. I don't think they're going to like the sport all that much. <laughs> no, but, and, yeah. uh, you know, going to this whole thing that we were just talking about, which actually plays into the video we just watched. I mean, the goal of when you're trolling is covering water, but we are also trying to do the same with the technique you just talked about, which is you're covering water, but you're trying to eliminate unproductive water. Yeah. And you're trying to keep your fly or for spin fishermen, your yeah. lure, Moving. in the most productive waters in that lake. And let's face it, in a lake, what is there, what, 10 to 20% of a lake at most that has fish yeah. in it actively yeah. feeding? Yeah, depending on the lake and you want to lake, but yep. you know what I mean? There's a lot of unproductive water. Yeah. So it's what you have to do. And this is what I like about still water fishing is you have to think that like you have to eliminate all that unproductive water mm -hmm. and assess and assess and reassess and look for the clues, the birds, the bugs, the fish movements. Or as mm -hmm. Phil, you know this, uh, Brian likes to call them the happy fish. Um, <laughs> when you see those total bowl flushes off down the yeah. other end of the lake, you go, I think I can eliminate some water right now. <laughs> yeah, we call it the two fish rule. You see a fish roll in an area more than twice, uh, especially if you're fishing with Brian, you better have that anchor up or you're getting buggy whipped. With <laughs> you know, what took you so long? Um, yeah, and, and for finding, uh, the analogy I use on lakes is, is uh, a little phrase I call DRP. You know, most people, you know, probably the most asked question I get asked on, on broadcasts like this or anything else is, is all about the fly. And the fly, uh, as you probably know, is the ultimate scapegoat, right? If you're not successful, it was the fly's fault. And, and unfortunately, the reality is it's rarely the fly's fault. It's the operator behind it. <laughs> yeah. that, uh, and I, I, Of course, I'm no different. So the analogy DRP stands for depth retrieve pattern. So when you're in a, you know, deciding what to do in lakes, depth is arguably the most important element to think about because trout are usually very selective on depth but generally opportunistic on what they eat so we most people don't let their flies sink long enough to get down because usually you're trying to get your flies within a foot or two of the bottom because it's safe to be there and that's where the food is and then the retrieve most people rip and strip their flies around way too fast on lakes you know as you've seen colin most of those bugs are you know they're prolific but they're not olympic athletes they don't have rocket packs strapped to them they don't move very fast so you don't no. have nice slow natural presentation and then you want to think about pattern and quite often if i'm in an area and i'm not catching fish i'm confident i'm fishing at the right depth again that zone just above the bottom i'm moving my fly in a natural pace most of the times we're doing imitative uh techniques um and i'm not catching fish i'm probably going to move because there's nobody there because as you said you can have all the best flying technique in the world if there's no fish there um you're not catching anything right and they they move and they cruise Right, and they like certain areas, and they don't like other areas. Right, so most yeah. of the time they're near food. There's shallow areas where weed beds are, and transitions into deep water, so they have that escape route um, to get out of trouble. All right. So, okay, um, Aaron here, uh, and I'm going to go to. I've got a video uh, that talks about your DRP. Yeah. But let's go to Aaron's uh, question here, which looks yeah. excellent. And he's got a gun too, so you better answer it. <laughs> I should say a rifle. Yeah, that's a yeah. So yeah, you should know better. This is a rifle. I know. A gun, full metal jacket. Um, don't do very much still water <laughs> fishing, but I've always been told and had success on the downwind side of a body of water. My question is, if you find yourself on a still water, which is actually, on, which is actually on a windless day with no rises. Wow, you know one of the hardest um, times to fish a lake is a flat, calm, bright day. Very, very hard. Um, wind is your friend on lakes um believe it or not um you know and actually if there's a wind up a lot of times if you can you want to like you talked about fish the downwind side the side that's getting um the wave action down there because that's going to churn up food um trout are going to have a little bit uh <laughs> service rifle yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that little semi-automatic automatic feature too <laughs> makes it a little more serviceable <laughs> Um, yeah, so uh, that downwind side's always good. Um, although there are times, you know, in the summer months, um, the wind can push uh, warmer, less oxygenated uh, water into areas, which could cause fish to slide and, and move out there as well. But uh, yeah, um, clear, calm water fishing from shore. If, if there's any down, I'd go find anywhere there's a ripple. 
mm -hmm. uh, because it's going to mask your presentation too. It works like a, a riffle on a on a river, right? You can get quite close to fish in shallow riffled water because all that uh, the, the broken water diffuses light and breaks up your silhouette and things like that. And you can get close, and, and those fish can be right in tight uh, feeding on any food sources that that wave action or that wind action uh, is disturbing. So, uh, yeah. in terms of your videos here, Phil. Mm -hmm. Is yep. it the balanced leech one you want to watch or the techniques and tactics? Is that the DRP? Uh, I'm not sure. The, the balanced leech one is just about how to fish them because most people, that is a fly that's become very popular on lakes. Oh, and I love that fly. Yeah, and most people think it's an indicator fly. So it talks about using it both in, in, in its the conditions it was designed to be fished under an indicator, but also it's a fantastic cast and retrieve pattern too. Okay, well, hang on. Let me throw this up and show it to everyone. Yeah. When things aren't going to plan and you're not catching fish like you think you should be, or worse, others are catching fish, the first solution to the puzzle always seems to be, what fly are we using? Or what fly are they using? And you can ask other people, and it's the most guarded secret out there. Sometimes they'll tell you, and it could be a pet name only they know of. It's a stumpy. What the heck is a stumpy? I don't know what a stumpy is. I don't have one in my box. Or they may not give you accurate information. They could be say one thing and be fishing something totally different. So how do you get through this problem? Well, why not think DRP, depth retrieve pattern. Do I have my fly at the right depth? Have I chosen the right fly line? You want to get your flies consistently, most times within one to two feet of the bottom where fish can cruise and patrol safely and where the habitat, all the food sources they feed upon can be found. Then you want to think about retrieve. Am I moving the fly at the right pace? Most of us get excited and tend to move our flies a little faster than we should, so we need to slow down. And then you want to start thinking about pattern. Do I have the right pattern style on? Should it be suggestive? Should it be an attractor pattern? Should it be imitative? Should it match some of the insects we see? While fly pattern is important, you always want to think DRP. And I'll be honest, if I think I've got the right fly pattern on, and DR is not working for me, in other words, I've chosen the right depth, I'm removing the fly at the right place, I'm going to move. So think about it next time, DRP before you default to pattern. Excellent. Still awake? Everything we just talked about, yep. yeah. Yep, yep, I don't probably believe in that. <laughs> Still awake. <laughs> You're too riveting, Phil. There's no way I'd fall asleep. <laughs> <laughs> that was really but that's true and, and again it's it's i remember when i was a spin fisherman and i would be out there and people were catching fish and you go up what are you using oh i'm using the j da 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 rapella in chartreuse or whatever yeah. and we have them put them on but we weren't at the right depth yeah. we weren't at the right depth they had the right amount of line out they were mm -hmm using the, the the right lip on the a certain type of uh rappella, say and they're getting down to where the fish were where they were feeding and that's you know where the fish are in the water column uh, as you said in the video it's one of the top questions or one of the the thing but people and i'm guilty of it we yeah. all go automatically to oh it's got to be my fly yeah and it's not yeah but it's no different when you're nymphing on a river right you can have the best uh, nymphing pattern if you're indicator fishing under you know you got your fly under an indicator and you don't have it set deep enough you're just drifting over the fish and same if you're tight lining european nymphing if you don't have the right pattern weight on your fly's not getting down to where the fish you know like to hold um right near the bottom it's no different so another question. question here for you Ooh, how could you give tips on how to set up drips for traditional lock style fishing on lakes i'm still going to you know um look for structure if i can you know in the wind when you're lock styling for those that aren't familiar with it that's fishing uh you are always in motion so you're fishing downwind you are using uh fishing out of a boat perpendicular to the wind and you've got a a drogue which is basically a, a an underwater parachute of sorts that slows and controls your drift so similar to trolling i dare with the analogy here but you are covering water and that's the argument of, of lock style fishing, you're always covering water and you're always presenting your flies to fresh fish because when you lock style, unlike trolling, your flies precede you. Whereas when you troll, you precede your flies, right? Which 
you know, in certain circumstances can put fish off as you drive over them and they scatter. And then, um, you know, conversely with lock style, you're drifting down to them. So I would still try and target the same structure. Um, I'd be looking at, um, you know, bathymetric maps or Google Earth is great to try and plan drifts that work with the wind you've got on any given day. If you can, you know, parallel to uh, a drop off or a transition area, you can even adjust the uh, rope or straps on your um, drogue so you can crab. So if you've got two anglers in the boat, you, you, although you're drifting downwind, you're drifting on an angle and both people have the opportunity to cast onto that structure and pull their flies off. Um, around points, a lot of times if there's wind on um, coming around a point, it'll cause a subtle eddy effect. And uh, you can just start your drift just upwind of that point and then drift down by the, the top of that point and work that eddy and then pick up and go back through and just work it over and over again. So with lock style, um, once you find some fish, um, you just go back and repeat that drift um, or, um, you know, you consistently hit fish in the spot. And if you're not opposed to it, you could anchor up and take advantage of that and unlock yourself on that point and take advantage of those fish. But I'm still looking um, for the same areas um, to go through. I, I, truthfully, because with lock style, I'm trying to make some good line choices. If I have a, the opportunity, I'm going to want to try and fish a section of the lake where the, the depth is relatively consistent. You know, mm -hmm. I don't want to start in 10 feet and then drift into 40 feet and then into 15 and back into 30 again, because there's going to be, unless you change the lines quickly or have an, a spare, another rod ready to go, um, with what you anticipate might be happening, um, you're going to be fishing some dead water too because you just can't get down. What's my favorite species to fish for and why? Have to go with rainbow trout. Love the silver beauty of them. I like silver bright fish. I like the way they pull. I like the way they jump. Um, you know, they they give a pretty good account of themselves on the fly rod. Sure do. I, I like even, a lot even little ones, eh, Phil? Yeah, they're they're pretty energetic, uh, energetic fish. I got a floater, a clear intermediate, medium and mid tip, seek three, seek five, another common line. Um, I've used a ladder once on Pyramid Lake in Nevada. Um, most of the lakes outside of that environment simply it's not conducive to fishing off a ladder. Uh, either the bottom is way too soft, you'll be more of a step ladder, <laughs> a little step because you'll be sunk in the mud or there's so much weed growth around the fringes of the lake you, you literally can't uh, it's very hard to present over top and across those uh, and catch fish on the other side and get them back and you've got land access issues and of course trees and things like that behind you that sort of get in the way of casting so that's why most of our fishing's um, done on boats as for other fly line questions i would have probably uh something fast like a type six or seven and uh, I'm a real fan of, the, of a hover line, a line that sinks like uber, uber slow, like one inch per second. Um, but he's, you've got a pretty good cross section of lines um, there. You know, I'm typically got floaters, midge tips, uh, which is a clear tip uh, on the end of a floating line. It's all integrated part of it. Uh, hovers, a couple of sink rates of clear intermediates. Type three sinks at three inches per second. Type five at five inches per second. A six, a seven. The newer uh, sweep lines as well that sink in a, in an arc. And do, the line has got different densities along its length, so it induces it to sweep through the water because there are times when we are trying to find the right depth. If we can make our flies sweep vertically through the water, um, we have a better chance of just rather than targeting specific depths and hope we hit something, right? So just a way to explore them. Yeah, Phil, if I could jump on and yeah. add uh, sweep line. Mm -hmm. I was in northern Manitoba two years ago at Little Duck Lake, and I was using those uh, sweep lines. They were perfect for lake trout. Yeah. Cruising yeah. lake trout around they the shoals. Spread out, yeah. Yeah, and we were using, you know, streamers, I don't know, four to six inches. Yeah. But they're, they weren't sinking flies. They were, uh, you know, neutrally buoyant. Yeah. But that line got them down, short leader, six to eight feet. Yeah. Perfect. Just Perfect fly line. No, they're a good line, and it's kind of ironic because everybody went to density compensation where the line sinks, um, you know, basically tip first for enhanced strike detection. Uh, but now the, the sweep lines have a place too, and your non-density compensate. A lot of times your entry-level lines have sweep tendencies because they are not density compensated. So their, their weight, the mass in the line isn't adjusted to sink tip first in a real quick uh, explanation. 
I, I don't think you were in fly fishing competitions before, Phil. You were more of a Bassmaster kind of guy, weren't you? Yeah, you know what? Got the live well going. And Kevin Van Dam still talks about you. Yeah, well. <laughs> yeah, we won't talk about the Missouri. But that was more at the bar. Yeah. <laughs> well, Boy, that are, guy could drink we beer. We are Canadian. <laughs> um, I did a little bit of competition fishing. Uh, I actually participated in the 2007 Canadian Championships uh, that were in Grand Prairie. I had a, a pretty good experience there. So. Must have been fun. Yeah, we won the gold medal, so it was good. <laughs> I retired. Where, I retired on top. I quit. <laughs> weren't you in that competition that was in Manitoba years ago, the Silver oh, yeah. Pig or whatever they called yeah, it? The Silver Pig. Yeah, yes. A, I won that one time as well. That was kind of a, um, yeah, it's not a strict uh, like Feeps Boosh uh, uh, regulated competition. It was more just uh, we're going fishing for four hours and never catching the most wins. <laughs> I think it was pretty unregulated, actually, but it was a lot of fun. <laughs> yeah, it was. It was. <laughs> there was in the park ones. What was the name of the um, the event they used to have out there every year? The trout. Oh, something bug. No, that's the Bug Chucker Cup. That's still going on out there. The trout. The Festival Bug Chucker. That's the one in Roblin, isn't it? Or. Yeah. Yeah, that still goes on, but there used to be the Trout Festival. It used to rotate around between Roblin, Russell, Rossburn. Um, each municipality would take it on for a year. I don't think yeah. that's been around for a while. Yeah. Okay, so let's talk about balanced leeches. And I, and I should explain that balanced leeches, you, you showed me how to use them mm -hmm. years ago. And I remember when I discovered the ice minnow, what a fabulous pattern that was as a balanced pattern below an indicator. And I remember it was so effective in the parklands and other places. And then I brought it back here to where I live in Ontario. And I'm being, I was on a river one day and I had this complex problem of smallmouth bass and currents where I couldn't get a good cast to them without the current taking the fly away from them too quickly, right? On a straight line. And it suddenly struck me. I just happened to have some indicators in my bag, pulled them out put a, a balanced leech, I think it was a bruise leech. Good choice. <laughs> yeah, two and a half feet down, because yep. they were only in about three three feet of water. Yep. And I made like two casts and it was like fish. I just methodically took that whole run apart. Yep. It kind of reminded me of steelhead fishing in Pennsylvania. Yeah. And you know, they're kind of relatively shallow water and the fish are there, but with a balanced leech, oh, it was killer. So why don't we play the video? And then we'll talk about this, okay? Sure. In recent years, balance flies have become incredibly popular. So what's a balance fly? Well, a balance fly starts with a small up-eye jig hook. For years, we could only get large jig hooks, say 10 or 8, and all we could really do is fish balance leeches. But with the popularity of European nymphing, we have now lots of smaller jig hooks at our disposal, 14s, 16s, even 18s. So what we do after getting the jig hook is get us, we need a, an extension. And the extension is a small pin, a common sewing pin, or a smaller sequin pin. We then slide on a tungsten bead. It has to be tungsten because tungsten has the mass to tip the fly horizontal. Once we have the pin assembly put together, we then lash it to the hook to make the fly balance. Balance flies have had a huge influence on how I design flies and how I fish them. Why? Because they work so well for me. Although originally designed to be fished under an indicator, there are a number of ways to fish balance flies. After all, a balance fly is just a small jig, arguably the best lure ever designed. So probably the most popular method everybody is familiar with is suspending a balance fly under an indicator. And due to its construction, it sits primarily horizontal in the water. And that's the way most food sources in lakes move. Leeches, minnows, dragonfly nymphs, damselfly nymphs, all of these food sources move horizontally. If you took a traditional bead head fly and hung it under an indicator, it would hang vertically. And that's unnatural. Now, although that is successful, Balance flies, in my experience, far outperform a traditional beadhead fly suspended under an indicator. 
So I typically set the fly so it'll hang about one to two feet off the bottom. When you're using larger flies, you can have more depth variance because I believe a fish will move further for a larger food source. As with all indicator presentations, you want to keep your cast short so you don't miss those subtle takes and if you do see the take, you can react quick enough. We want to use roll casts whenever possible because these are heavy flies and when coupled with the level uh, leaders that Brian and I like to fish under indicators, it's a tangle prone system and the roll cast will keep you out of trouble. You can fish these flies static, you can use a slow hand twist, you can use a strip and then let the fly pause and whenever you do that technique, always watch the indicator as the fly settles as that's when you're going to most likely get the take. Using indicators works all season long, but it's a personal favorite when the water temperatures are cool, such as early spring and late fall. Another great presentation option when using balanced flies is to fish them vertically under fast sinking lines so they suspend about a foot off the bottom. It's a method Brian and I love to use when we're coronamid fishing in deep water, say water deeper than 20 feet, and it works especially well with balanced flies too, particularly balanced leeches and balanced minnows. We use this method because of the short leaders. If you try to do uh, fish balance flies under floating lines with longer leaders, they're tangle prone. We're using short leaders when we dangle, typically five feet. Three feet of 2X coupled to two feet of 3X. If you want to learn more on how to set up for dangling, visit our tricks and techniques chapter in the app and we have a full explanation. And remember, always hold on to the rod because the takes are aggressive. Cast and retrieve techniques also work very well with balanced flies. After all, a balanced fly is nothing more than a small jig. And as I said in the intro, small jigs and jigs are arguably the best lure ever made to catch fish. I like to use them with floating lines and say 12 or 14 foot leaders or slow sinking lines such as a hover or a clear intermediate. We're just gonna cast them out, allow them time to sink and then we're going to strip them back using a four to six inch strip pause retrieve. And the pauses are prolonged to allow that fly to settle and sink down. The beauty of this method is the fly rides hook point up, nose down. It doesn't really fish horizontally, but you get that nice jigging and pitching action, which is very seductive and tough for fish to leave alone. You want to have this retrieve. I almost punctuate it with a little thermometer pop I call it as though you had a thermometer in your hands and you were shaking it. This method works so well because you can walk balanced flies over lightly weeded bottoms, rocky bottoms because of the way the fly swims in the water. Fish love this presentation Fish option and over. take the fly good with gusto. That's a good eat. Wow. Uh, well, I just want to, I don't want to criticize or anything, but that was kind of weak on information. Um, I could have used a little more detail. I know, I know. <laughs> more show. That was fall. fabulous, Phil. That was fabulous. And, you know, if I could say, I mean, it was a bit of a fire hose of information, yeah. but that's what you want because that type of video, very much like when I'm watching car repair videos on YouTube, there's so much in them. You're going to watch them four, five, six times. And the fact is that with the app, I can watch that in the field and go back to that little piece about, oh, what was the line he used? How long was the leader for that jig hook style with no indicator? Da, 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 da. And I got to tell you, anybody that's watching this, if you haven't used the balance leeches, the the patterns like the ice minnow, yeah. oh, the ice minnow, that's just killer. Um, it just, they changed the way I fished yeah. on lakes. They totally changed the way I fished on lakes. I've been successful. Doesn't matter if I'm in Labrador, I'm down in Idaho wherever that that just that system works so well yeah i've used them for bass i remember i was down doing some speaking in oregon a number of years ago and i was staying at a house that had a, a small one acre bass pond in the backyard it was horrible um so um i asked how big the bass were and uh, my friend down there said you want to see them sure so we ran in the house and got a spinning rod with those white mr twister tails those things should be legal but those things the bass just came out and annihilated that well i didn't have obviously a fly that uh, a, Mr. a twister tail or anything, but I had a balanced leech and I would just fish a floating line because it was a shallow pond, cast it out, make sure it hit the bottom and just do that strip pause, like that thermometer shake where you kind of throw your hand down a bit and I would make the fly and I would just see the line tighten up because the bass, that fly is able, because it fishes nose down, just walks over the bottom like a jig, a bass jig. 
and they just sucked it up and the line went, that's all you'd feel is you'd see that line go tight like a, the naked technique when we're chronomet fishing and set up. And I got some nice largemouth bass doing that and a few very large bluegills I didn't even know were in there. So, um, yeah, it's not just the whole moral of that one was just everybody thinks it's just an indicator fly and it's not. Right, it's got so many. I even use them uh, European nymphing on rivers and streams as well, right? Because it's it's tungsten. <laughs> it's good on an indicator on a euro rig. So if, if people want to learn how to tie mm -hmm. some of the different patterns that are like the bruise leech, yeah. the ice minnow, and other patterns that are so effective as a balanced uh, yeah. pattern, um, your YouTube channel yep. is they a good resource. As well, but you can also go to my YouTube, my Phil Rowley YouTube channel. And they're all there. I've got a number. Of, I've got the balanced ice minnow. You know, that's originally a variation of Bob Morensky. He's out of North Dakota. And we both ran into him in Manitoba. We took his, basically his fly he designed as a cast and retrieve pattern and gave it a balanced facelift. Um, you know, the CBO, that's the fly I caught a uh, big, huge rainbow down in Argentina on. Olive pumpkin, bruised um, as well. So lots of balanced flies in there. Balanced minnows, balanced pheasant tails. Try to figure out a balanced dry fly. Don't think you need one. But. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've seen you say that. Uh, Mark was with a very inventive guy down in Idaho, and he taught him how to use uh, a certain type of dry fly as a wet fly, and he absolutely killed the trout with it. But yeah. I'll let him talk about it with the guide. Yeah. Uh, and just, wow. We're going to be putting it into our guide tips on our YouTube channel. But yeah, it, it does work actually. And it's the way he did some trimming to this very heavy hair kind of dry fly. But yeah. uh, I don't want to give away anymore, but it just, I learned a lot. This is what's great about fly fishing. Every oh, time yeah. you think you know, you don't know. You, you know, learn something that's new. That's why right? my motto is you never stop learning because you don't, right? You never oh, do, yeah. you know, and that's what makes it, I think that's why I like it so much. It's you're always, you're never settled. It's always moving forward. There's always something new to learn, new to figure out. You know, sometimes those days when you're not being as successful as you hoped or you learn the most, right? Because you're really bearing down and thinking the problem through, right? Kind of like my wife telling me I'm always in training. We all married men are. And the sooner we realize it, the except, except, except the fact <laughs> you're always in school. That's, right. exactly. <laughs> That's amongst other things like cleaning the garage, right, Phil? <laughs> Very important. Yeah, very so, important. <laughs> so, uh, if you don't mind staying with us, we've gone over the yeah. hour. Yeah. You know, and I know yeah. people love, you know, asking yeah. you questions and hearing the things we're talking about. Mm -hmm. So, Phil, um, the, one of the things that you did last year, and it was probably one of the best, I think, shows you've ever done. And you've done some absolutely fantastic shows with the new Fly Fisher as a host. Mm -hmm. But the one you did down on Henry's Lake in Idaho, I mean, that was kind of like hitting it out of the park. It was just. It turned out well. <laughs> it did. Yes. And if you don't mind, I'm going to play, uh, or actually, let's see if I got a video here. Uh, yeah, I do. Let's see what Mark grabbed. Mark grabbed this for me. And okay. let me preface it first by showing. Is that one of those Henry's Lake hogs? Yeah, that's what they call a hybrid. Um, that was oh, yeah, look at the cutthroat uh, yep. underneath the there chin, eh? rainbow uh, cutthroat mix down there the locally known as the hybrids and they're the ones that get to be big um, the lakes also got brookies in it and uh, yellowstone cuts as well but no, nowhere near this size wow that was, that was the last day of the shoot of the morning uh, mark had to leave about noon i think um to go pick up tom rosenbauer because he was coming to join us as well from orvis and uh yeah we ran into that <laughs> what a tank what a tank yeah well, uh, let's just show a little clip from this. And, and this, by the way, the whole full length video is in our YouTube channel for anybody yeah. watching. And uh, it's been immensely successful. And it's funny, we were just laughing about this before we started the video clip or the, the, the interview, uh, Phil and I, about how many people have been in contact with you, Phil, mm -hmm. who said, because of you, I went to Henry's Lake. Oh, no. And, and, they, and they all, but they were all so happy because they had such yeah. a good time. So let's just show the video. Whacked it pretty good. Feels bigger. Now, it could have just buried in the weeds too, but when it took the fly, it was a solid thump. 
and took it on the paws. I've been using quick strips with pauses, three to four inch strips, and the fly was just falling and it just zipped out of my hands. Just my concern is we're in shallow water and it could take me into a weed patch, but oh, this is throbbing and thumping. Got it on the, oh, now it's coming at me. No, now it's going away. This feels, I am cautiously optimistic for a big fish. Henry's is known for big hybrids in excess of 10 pounds, even 15 pounds. So we've been hoping for something at least half of that. And this feels like a solid fish. This is why you come to Idaho and you come to Henry's Lake. This lake, if you're a still water enthusiast, which I am, this is one of those lakes you read about and you say, I'm gonna, I'm coming here one day. It's a spectacular setting. Big, powerful. Oh, 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 oh my Lord. Scooper, my friend. <laughs> I don't know if I can, you're gonna have to sit this baby down in my lap. I don't know if I can hold her. Look, look at that thing. Holy smokes. That's why you come to Idaho. That's Henry's Lake, one of the few places in North America that you can have the chance to do battle with something like this. The stories this fish could tell, the food it's eaten, it's spectacular. This has made my trip and my year so far on lakes. This is why you fish the fall, because these tanks come out to play. Let's put you back, girl. Wow, that was a Henry's Lake hog. Oh, I want to go back so bad. <laughs> <laughs> and you were using that technique we were just talking about. Uh, that sounded like we're using. Yeah, like I was using a type three line and a, a leech pattern. Um, but uh, we were fishing balanced leeches and doing really well with them as well. Yeah, but, but uh, I saw your line when you were fighting it. Yeah, it looked like a sinking line, and you yeah. said you were doing it. You were jigging it along, right? Yeah, stripping along, and then the line just literally just took off out of my hands um usually you miss those takes i guess it was just serendipity it was meant to be it was uh, <laughs> it was it was uh, pretty special i think our guy uh, kevin uh said he figured it went 13 pounds so you know we wanted to get it back in the water we didn't spend any time measuring. it was hard enough just to pick it up to get out of the net so i could safely get it back in the water my hands aren't that big to go around the wrist of that tail so that's wow. still swimming around in there hopefully so we can go back and uh, get it again that whole area down there is such a you know, you you, I, you sent me down there years ago to fish with Bob Jacklin. Oh, yeah. Uh, fish the Madison, and we fish Hebgen Lake um, and uh, sort of fell in love with the region. I get down there at least once a year, every year if I can. It's only about a 12-hour a drive for me straight due south, and uh, it's just so it's, it's such some fantastic stillwater fisheries. You've got Henry's Lake, obviously, which if you're a stillwater fly fisher, that's um, – you know, one of the, the places to go in North America. It's got such a rich history. Uh, Hebgen Lake, Quake Lake, um, Cliff and Wade, uh, Island Park Reservoir. Uh, there's a private Lake Sheridan just down the road as well. There's just lots of still water opportunities. And touch wood, it's, it doesn't get the amount of pressure that the, all the, the world famous rivers and streams down there because everybody's, you got the Madison, you got the Henry's Fork, all the rivers in Yellowstone Park, which you should you should and must visit when you're down there but the lakes are uh, are pretty special down there too sweet yeah so uh titan big dog is asking hey phil uh do you prefer white beads or black or what for your chronomids both and that's a nice consistent answer um generally um <laughs> and, and i tie both styles generally i'll use white beads uh, when I'm fishing deeper, um, because they'll, they'll start, they'll pop, they'll stand out, easy for the fish to find. In water, algae-type lakes that have lots of suspended matter, a lake like Henry's um, has that as well, because if you use other gill materials, they can foul up. Um, but conversely, if you're fishing really clear waters, we often shy away from a white bead because it's too overt, too stark, and pops too much, and fish can avoid them. So we'll have, I'll have flies tied, the same fly, 
um, tied with a white bead and then uh, the same fly with a black nickel bead and some yarn gills. Um, that's a little more imitative and less, uh, you know, overt and loud um, down there as well. And, and sometimes um, if you've all you got is white bead patterns, I always have a black marker with me as well. So if I need to, I can take the marker out and color up some of that white bead to make it not so um, white. So you want to have a mix um, of them um, to do that. Yeah. Okay, let's get back to the most important thing, and 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 that's uh, your you know your fly tying abilities. No, I'm sorry, no, your book. My book, yes. Your book. Everything. Actually, I'm really excited about this because I've got your other books, Phil. You've got a number of uh, great books you've published yeah. over the years. Gosh, you know, it's hate to say, it, Phil, it's been 20 years. We've known yeah. each other 20 years. Well, it's been 20 years uh, since my first book, Fly Patterns for Water, for Still Waters, came out. And sadly, I think that book is on its last legs <laughs> as far as... Uh, <laughs> no, the other way. It'd yeah. be the other way. Creepy. <laughs> it, it's on its last <laughs> legs. Uh, as forget this chair going and everything's mirrored here. It's on its last legs as far as publication. It's um, going to be out of print soon. So... Uh, um, you know, I swore after I did this book, I'd take a break for a while, but, um, I thought of re-energizing or reprinting, uh, the fly patterns for still waters book, but that's been 20 years. I played around with a few other patterns since that time, including the balance leeches we've been talking about. So it may be time to think about doing another one. I can't believe I said that, but <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh, you're never going to get that script. No, you're getting it. <laughs> so, uh, Evans asked a question about what's your most memorable day on still waters? That day on Henry's was pretty memorable, and uh, my second to last day on Lago Strobel last year, um, because I got the honor and the pleasure of catching and releasing a 21 and a half pound rainbow on a balance fly. Wow. Is that, uh, that wasn't That's this one, was it? No, not that one. It might be the other one. I think I sent you a picture of that just to uh... uh... Nope. That's the big That's bull trout. Out. A big yeah. bull trout out of BC. I do fish rivers. Oh, you know something? That was the one photo, for whatever reason, Phil, it didn't open up. Hmm. And it wasn't that one. That's just a little guy. Uh, okay. Well, but we can just say it's bigger than this one. It's bigger than this one, yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that was pretty memorable. I was, um, you know, it's so windy down there. I was fishing uh, under, i got to get this camera thing figured out. I was fishing uh, under an indicator, and uh, believe it or not, Indicators are a good choice in really windy conditions because once you get the fly in the water, it stays there. There's very, you know, the casting, your casting is reduced. Of course, wind causes, you know, how we man, how we try to manage the wind causes our casting challenges. And uh, I saw this fish swimming up because the water is crystal clear. And I saw it cruising along. And, you know, by about day four or five on there, you've seen a lot of good sized fish. So you just sort of, well, that's a nice fish, but didn't really realize how nice and then it just sort of descended and it went out of view. And a second and a half later, my indicator went under and then it came out of the water like a king salmon. And that's when I said, oh, get focused <laughs> get your <laughs> on the reel because we're all fishing on these rocks and the rocks. I don't know if you see in the background, but they look kind of coral like because they're encrusted in calcium from the wave action, and the wind. And they're all jagged and and wind worn and, uh, you know perfect places for fly line to get tangled up or cut. Um, so I was fortunate enough to, to get that thing in. And I remember lying on the rocks, like just literally lying down after just um, thanking my lucky stars. Like I was fortunate enough to get something like that. Yeah, we all deserve that every once in a while. That first trip to a fortress memorable. Um, I've had some memorable days where the fishing hasn't been good. I love fishing crystal clear lakes. You know, they're, they're very challenging. Um, you know, you're sight fishing a lot of times or you see the fish and you're trying to figure it out. So I've got a favorite lake in BC called Sheridan Lake. It's a big, um, big lake, um, but it's kind of an anomaly because usually big lakes aren't very productive, but this thing is just chocker block full with bugs, right? But big fish, 10 pound plus swimming around all the time, giving you the bad, eye, giving you the stink eye. They won't come near you because they can see. <laughs> My favorite stripping basket. Um, I've got a new one that I was just got my hands on and I should, I haven't, um, you know, you've made the ones up with the, the wash basin type of thing and a bungee cord for a belt and, and those work well, but this is a, it's like a flat plate and I'll have to dig out the name and it's got like little monofilament fingers that come up. And the beauty of this is you can, if you're stripping 
sort of straight below you, like a slow hand twist or something. You can drop the fly sort of straight in front of your, uh, in front of you. Or if you're stripping more, you can swing it around the side and you just literally lay the line amongst these um, uh, sort of tentacles, if you will, and it catches them. And then you just cast again and it just comes out. It, it works really slick, really simple and very portable. Are you normally boat based? Does B Chan raz you harder than the video show? Oh yes. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody thinks Brian's a wonderful human being, and he's he's often seen as quiet, and uh, but he's got a dark. Uh, no, he's got a dark side. Well, <laughs> <laughs> Doctor yeah, Cheesy. Um, we predominantly boat fish. I love to shore fish whenever I get the chance, um, but so many of our lakes are, um, you know, the productive lakes have thick muddy bottoms which is great for weed growth but not so great for standing in um, and lots of shoreline vegetation um, that you just simply can't get out through or or if you hook a fish on the other side you've got the challenge are you going to drag this poor fish back through all the weeds you're going to lose them and a lot of back cast issues with trees right down to the water line and um, private property issues as well um, you know you just can't go traipsing through somebody's land uh, to go fishing so a boat gives you you know frankly we do spend a lot of time in, you know, in lakes where most productive and water 20 feet deep or less because photosynthesis stimulates plant growth, habitat for bugs, fish come to feed. The whole circle of life is going on there. So, uh, and we spend a lot of time near shore doing that, but the boat is the best way to do it and to have the ability to move all over the place. Right? We can pick up and go uh, at a moment's notice and go to the other end of the lake if we want to. My favorite method of fly fishing if I had one way to fish a lake, it would be the naked technique. That's a floating line, long leader, no indicator. John's smiling. <laughs> well, it was, if it was asked of me, it would be that one. It's, yeah. I find it difficult to do. Oh, it's it's very di it's challenging but, because wow. you're, yeah, you're balancing the leader length because we have a formula. We want our leaders about 25% longer than the water is deep we're fishing. Um, it's a weighted technique. We're fishing predominantly chironomids, but other small weighted nymphs, pheasant tails, mayfly patterns, damsels, things like that, even leeches. We did that in the fortress. Um, speed of your retrieve is a very, very slow retrieve. Otherwise, you'll just start to pull your fly up through the water, and that's not good because um, you're pulling it out of the zone. And then um, your wait time. So typically, I'm letting these flies sink 30, 40 seconds, which to some people is agony. It's like sitting in the lineup at uh, Tim Hortons or something. Like to get to <laughs> you know, is this ever going to end? Um, but it teaches, for me, it teaches two critical still water presentation elements, and that's patience and touch. The patience to let flies sink, to move them slow enough to be effective, and learning to recognize subtle takes. Sometimes we're only seeing takes as the fly line straightens or moves left or right. Or you get those, you know, nice, more confident takes that are very similar to how a trout takes a fly on a swing on a river, a wet fly swing, that sort of little stab. It's very addictive and kind of gets in your blood and you want to do it over and over again. It's If you can master the naked technique, um, it'll really pay dividends uh, to other presentation techniques you use in lakes because it just teaches you so many good presentation skills. Phil, all I can add to that is I remember the first time you took me out and we did that at two places in the Parklands. West Goose. West Goose yeah. and uh, out at... Um, What's it called? The the big lake there. Patterson. Patterson. Yeah. On a point, but yeah. the point. I guess the big point about the point is that watching my you know casting this long leader multi fly rig out there and in yeah. my head I'm going wow this is a waste of time and I'm letting it drift in the wind and I'm doing this very very slow and then the sea suddenly goes straight yeah. and the lines going out of my hand i'm like whoa yeah it's that is of, so cool it's sort of the it's not maybe a great analogy but it's comparable it's sort of the euro nymphing version of stillwater fishing the leader makeup the watching the line for takes the you know the subtleness on it um all that stuff it's maybe not the best analogy but somewhat similar it's the most complex probably method we use uh, fly fishing uh, lakes along with indicator techniques. People think you just stick a bobber on and chuck it out there and wait for it to pull under. There's a lot more to indicator fishing to be consistently good at it. Well, I just would equate it to the difference between walking across a bridge or bungee jumping off of it. It was a lot of fun. <laughs> a lot of fun. Yeah, once you get over the fear, you're going to die. 
So, Jokey, Joe, when dangling. Yeah, I was going to say, smoking Joe. Uh, when dangling, long or short leaders? I like short leaders, like five feet, four feet. Um, because dangling is where we're fishing. For those of you who don't know, we're fishing a full sinking line straight down below the rod tip in deep water. Um, and we literally let it hang or dangle. we got some great names in fly fishing, right? Fly tying, fly fishing lakes, dangling, naked technique. We fish boobies. Something wrong with us, I guess. Um, but we're fishing straight down, so we, we, we don't need to have a, a terribly long leader. Um, usually it's um, maybe three feet of 2X and then to a couple feet of um, 3X. I like to have like a break point in there, a junction, if you will, a fusible link between the two. So if you get a break off, because with that method, the takes are like they're addictive. You like to take, I don't know if you've, if you've dangled before when we filmed. I can't a remember. A little bit. You're but the, just... take, the takes are literally, the first time I ever had success with it was on Dry Falls Lake in eastern Washington, uh, back when I float tubed a lot. And we were sitting in 22 feet of water. The fish weren't in the shallow. So we'd heard about this. We thought we'd give it a try. And I'm just sitting there sort of watch the beauty of this method too, is you don't have to watch fly line or indicators or any of that stuff. You can you know, be looking around and uh, the take, the fish hit so hard that that rod tip was sitting about that far above the water went from that position to between my legs and out behind my butt in less than a second. Right. And I got the fish in and it was about this long. So when we did it out in the parklands where, you know, when it was in its prime and you're getting six to eight pound rainbows, taking the fly that way, it was, um, it was, I've had some guests that had the rods bent over so hard it's bending around the gunnel of the boat at the butt, and you're just Ooh, everybody yeah. like safety glasses waiting for the. Is the <laughs> you know, I've had friends. The only thing with that method is never ever let go of the rod. Don't put it down uh, to grab a sandwich. The only time you put it down is if you've got a rod holder to put it in, um, because I had uh, uh, some good friends of mine, husband and wife, uh, were in BC and. Uh, she put a rod under, I think she told me it was on, flipped her seat back over on it and heard a sound and it was gone that fast. Right. And uh, kudos to her husband because her husband, not mad, said, what fly did he take? <laughs> <laughs> that's, now, Barry, that's Barry, isn't it? No, no. No, nope, somebody else? Okay. will be a friend of mine. And, uh, okay. Um, yeah. Um, but it's a method, boy, it's, when I do my chronomid clinics, my underwater clinics, I have to show dangling last because if I showed that first, nobody to hell with indicators or the naked technique or slow sinking line techniques for chronomid fishing. I just want to dangle. I want that take because it's crushing. It's literally from zero to a million, like it's being pushed off the bridge, bungee jumping, and you didn't expect it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, listen, Phil, I think we should wrap this up. Yeah. Um, for people who are out there that want to get your book, and uh, I'm going to bring it up again. But do you have this in your website so people can do an advance order now? Um, no, I'll, I'll get it up. Um, but um, I'll have to see if I've got the – let me just hey – Everybody, this is what the book looks like. It's uh, being published through Orvis. Yeah, I'm just bringing up my email. I usually turn it off because it bings and bongs throughout the presentation and nobody likes that. I appreciate I'm just... that. <laughs> I'm just going to grab the link. Um, bear with me here. Well, you know what you can do, Phil? Yeah. Uh, we can put it up on our Facebook page afterwards. Yeah. And I would recommend you put it into your website as soon as yep. you can, because I think the thing is, uh, it's kind of like when we were talking to John Garrett's last week. Yep. Um, there's so many people that are reading, like uh, Tom Rosenbauer was telling me this the other day, fly fishing books are just flying off the shelf right now, new yep. or used. and there's a everybody was into Kindles and everything else. Well, guess what? Everybody wants print again. Yeah. And I wouldn't be surprised if this goes to a second printing real fast. But if for anybody who wants to get the book now, yeah. For next May, they should order now. Like, yeah, I'm, I'll be ordering my copy. Yeah. Because I want to make sure I get one, right? Yep. Oh, you. I think so, I owe you one. I think I owe you one. Yes, I will get that up uh, for people. <laughs> Um, and they can then get that out. Like I said, I'm just, I'm literally sending the, uh, copy edits back tomorrow. I okay. think it's up today, a uh, big relief, uh, to get that done. And then it's all for layout and printing after that. I hope. Important uh, thing is lots of pictures for guys like me. Yes. You keep your diagrams. Way. Diagrams. Uh, my son, Sean, the graphic artist, he did them for me. Uh, diagrams, pictures, uh, all that stuff. How, you know, lots of step-by-steps, hand twists and different retrieves and 
knots and, and all that stuff. I'm, you know, I'd love, I'd love to have put more pictures in it, but okay. uh, I think the publisher went, <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. If people want to contact you, Phil Rowley Fly Fishing and your Facebook page? Uh, my Facebook, yeah, Phil Rowley Fly Fishing and Facebook, same on Instagram, uh, flycraftangling.com. It's been scrolling by and email flycraft at shaw.ca. I always answer all my emails uh, sooner or later. <laughs> if I'm around, I usually answer them very quickly. If Colin emails me, I know I've got, I got to make up some excuses. So, <laughs> Dog died. Something yeah. like that. Oh, no. um, and then, of course, your app. You yeah. want to get your app. Yeah, Stillwater Fly Fishing app. Simply that simple. There is links to it um, on my um, website. And, of course, you just search um, your, your um, Google Play or um, uh, iTunes or whatever. Um, it'll be there as well. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, listen, Phil, thank you very much for being uh, on our program tonight being interviewed. I look forward to where we're going to send you this year. Mm -hmm. uh, I look forward to your shows. Uh, yep. The bike show is going to be great at Scott yep. Lake. And then uh, is it uh, Swan Lake yeah, Narrow Lodge? Hill, yeah, Narrow Hills uh, area, Swan Lake Lodge. We were up yeah. there. Yeah. Yep. And That's you did good. a great show there on still water fishing. Yep. And look forward to what you're going to do this coming year. Because, Like I said, we got a lot of things in the pot stirring right now. Yep. And I expect you to have some great shoots in some new locations. Yep. And congrats on the book. I know I've never written a book, but based on what I know of the, from people who write, it's very different to write a book that's a prose, like like yeah. full of it's a story. Yeah. And I'm not saying it's easy. No. But when it's not saying you're OCD, but you're very much a perfectionist film. Well, you well, want to you want to make sure because you think like an angler, and you want to have all the thought processes, yeah. all the pictures, all the writing, everything to make it really. You couldn't not understand. What yeah, you're and your worst nightmare is to be not clear on something or screw it up, get left instead of right. You know, and you know after you've read a book, that's why it's so great the editing process with the copy editor and everything because. That's their job, and, and that's what they do. They, they, you know, the, you know, the help they provide is invaluable. I can't thank the editors and the staff at uh, um, Lion Stack Pool um, for for doing this because it's uh, um, they they've caught me on a few things like, oh, that's not clear. Yeah, maybe I should clear that up a little bit, right? Um, so yeah, it's uh, fingers crossed. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's going to be a bestseller. Listen, Phil, thanks again for being on the show and. Uh, We'll hopefully have you on again uh, soon. Maybe yep. next time we'll have Brian there so he can uh, give you uh, the a hazy challenge. Yeah. A little hazy. <laughs> <laughs> Tell Phil and Brian stories. That would be fun. Yeah, well, that would be better. Anyways, thanks, yeah. Phil, for being on. Thanks, and everyone, Phil. we'll see you next week. And uh, take care and stay safe.